It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Every year, over 100,000 marine mammals die from the harmful effects of plastic, fishing nets, and trash in our oceans. Last month, Mexico's Federal Agency for Environmental Protection announced that more than 300 olive ridley sea turtles had died after apparently becoming entangled in a fishing net. The animals were found floating together off the coast of southern state of Oaxaca. Their shells cracked from more than a week of dying or drying in the sun. The news comes just a few days after another 113 sea turtles, most of which were also olive ridleys, washed ashore in Mexico's Chiapas state, approximately 100 miles east of Oaxaca. It is unclear in this latter case what killed the turtles, but some bore injuries consistent with those caused by hooks and nets. Now, this was a report that uh, we discovered here um, by uh, reading an article in the National Geographic magazine, but it is also the topic of conversation in terms of how to curtail it. It's a topic of policy setting. Now, the Marine Mammal Center in Salsalito, California says that marine debris is the main cause of the death of these mammals. For example, birds, fish, crabs, turtles, dolphins, and thousands of marine mammals get caught in this deadly silent floating debris in what they call ghost fishing. Now, joining me to talk about all of this and what's happening to these marine mammals, and of course, what we can do about it, is Brian Wallace, a marine biologist who's been studying sea turtles for almost 20 years. He's a senior scientist with the Conservation Science Partners and an adjunct professor at Duke University. I thank you so much for joining us, Brian. And thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. All right, Brian, let's start off with uh, telling us what's happening to the sea turtles and why. Uh, so, right. So in this particular case, as you just described in the intro, uh, what appears to have happened uh, is that a, a large number of olive ridley sea turtles, which tend to concentrate in this time of year and in that particular area off the coast of Oaxaca in southern Mexico, um, encountered what appears to have been a, a, a derelict piece of fishing gear, that is uh, a net that was operated by actively by fishermen, but for one reason or another was lost at sea. Um, and as, as you mentioned in the intro, uh, the, the general term we have for such derelict gear, uh, ghost nets in this case, um, sort of a macabre image, but um, although the net might be dead to fishermen, that is not operated by them anymore directly, it continues to go on and do its job uh, and, and continues to fish in the ocean. And so it appears that um, because given the, the high concentration of animals, that is olive ridley sea turtles in this area at that time of year, um, with this net indiscriminately fishing on its own, um, we have uh, what, what you saw in the, 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 the fairly um, shocking images of hundreds of turtles being entangled and drowned now, Brian, why does the fishermen just leave this, uh, these nets out there? I mean, they are costly. A um, lot of fishermen are you know, small scale fishermen. They need these nets. Um, why are they there? That's a fantastic question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, those that become ghost nets um, that, are, that is lost from the fishermen's control uh, oftentimes it's accidental, to be honest. Um, you know, fishing in the ocean, as you can imagine, is extremely challenging uh, logistically. Uh, you could have a, a pretty major storm that uproots uh, the anchors holding the net in place, and from one, um, you know, from one almost moment to the next, the net could be where it was set, and then it could and it could be gone. Um, and once that happens, of course, it can be. Uh, caught in currents and moved along pretty rapidly away from its its original location. So, um, not totally sure what happened in this very particular case, um, and why the net uh, um, was lost in the first place. Um, but chances are, has something to do with with, with one of those kinds of 
with one of those kinds of issues. Um, it's really unfortunate, as you mentioned. Uh, fishermen don't want to lose gear. Uh, it's, it's not only expensive, but if, in many of these cases, especially in small-scale um, fishing communities uh, around the world, frankly, uh, this is the primary source of livelihood for for most folks. And so, losing um, losing a, a net is is a significant blow. So it's not something that fishermen really want to have happen, and it's really unfortunate all around when it does. Right. Now, um, last week, environmentalists celebrated a victory in Sacramento when uh, California lawmakers overwhelmingly passed a uh, 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 legislation to use um, outlaw, basically outlaw drifting gill nets. Um, then gill nets are mile long nets blamed for unintentionally killing thousands of sea creatures, including endangered animals. Now, um, I know this is not a solution to the problem out there in a wider uh, scale, but uh, do you think this is a good uh, piece of legislation and that it will address the problem? Yeah, I, I, I'll admit uh, I don't know all the details of what was specifically passed, and so um, you know I'll refrain from speaking too far out of turn uh, on those on those kinds of things. Um, certainly, uh, where fishing gear, even when it's designed to or intended to catch specific things, in the case of the California drift net, that's uh, primarily swordfish. Um, just like in the example we were talking about before, if that gear is operating in a time and a place where there are protected species, so off the coast of California, of course, is a is a real hot spot, um, even globally, for concentrations of uh, of a lot of whale species, of sea turtles, again, seabirds, sharks, etc. Um, you know that gear can interact with species that that it isn't intended to, and I think the 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 uh, push behind this this particular ban has to do with affording even greater protections to those kinds of protected species that may be endangered for other reasons in the, in the first place and therefore vulnerable to further declines. Uh, this is a, a, a way of, or an in, the intention behind it would be a way of reducing further threats and hopefully providing a little more resilience to these populations. Right. Um, now, I understand that some 4,000 dolphins, 456 whales, 136 sea creatures um, have all died as far as, you know, keeping a tally on this stuff is concerned because of gill nets. Now, it's a good thing that California has done this, but this is a much wider problem worldwide, especially given that lots of small-scale um, fishermen and their communities rely on this kind of fishing and uh, and using being able to use these nets to fish. Um, give us some other ways in which this could be regulated and addressed as a problem out there. Yeah, thanks for that question. That's uh, it's a it's a really important point you made there about um, how important and how pervasive uh, net fisher fisheries are globally, and how important they are to coastal communities around the world. So, thus making it, of course, a, a, a really challenging issue from from an ecological and conservation perspective, as well as an you know an equity and resource access question. So, extremely challenging just at the outset there. Um, in terms of, uh, of efforts to try to um, promote sustainability in these kinds of fisheries, and that is both for the, for the fishermen in their communities, but then also for the broader ecosystem uh, species that they don't intend to catch, like sea turtles or birds or marine mammals. Um, there are a lot of really great efforts out there at the community level to engage fishing communities and trying to come up with solutions that make sense to allow them to continue to fish, hopefully more cleanly, and therefore, to be able, you know, in fact, to to tout the the higher value um, that they're able to to derive from what they're actually catching, because they're also using um, uh, ecologically more sustainable uh, fishing practices. And so there's a there's a, a really interesting, really important movement I think that's happening uh, in in a lot of places where uh, people are trying to essentially construct markets such that there is a higher demand that places a higher price point, higher value on products from small scale fisheries that are using these kinds of environmentally sound or more ecologically sustainable practices. So that's rewarding uh, small scale fishing communities 
for taking those extra steps. All right, Brian, so much more to discuss, particularly mm -hmm. the trash angle of this. We've been focused mm. on the fishing nets, uh, but I think that is something, you know, easily uh, can be dealt with. I know California has tackled the issue of outlawing, you know, plastic bags and um, plastics, and that's a good move, but it's something obviously that the rest of the world needs to adopt as well. Brian, I thank you so much for joining us today and um, giving us a, a peek into the problem um, of uh, trying to address the problem of these sea turtles showing up um, on our shores and, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, disturbance it causes to mammal life. But I look forward to having you back and uh, we'll continue talking about these things that seem uh, perhaps um, minor given you know the mm. world at war and other things that are going on and the environmental crisis we are facing but it is these small solutions that really uh, will will uh, uh, I guess end in a, a cumulative solution to the mm. environmental crisis we are facing I thank you so much mm. thanks Germany and thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.